Okay. Well, we're in Matthew. The Gospel according to Matthew. And uh, last time I taught in Matthew was, I think, about three weeks ago now. Uh, and then we went to uh, Matthew 21, verses 18 uh, through 32. And we learned a little bit about fig trees in this passage. And Jesus came upon a fig tree that had leaves but no fruit. Now, what was the interesting thing about that tree? They had leaves but no fruit. You don't remember? Come at the same time or one right after another? Yeah, fruit's supposed to start coming first, mm-hmm. then the leaves come, and then the fruit continues to grow. But this tree had no fruit on it. So, but it had the appearance, if you were to look at it from afar, you see a fig tree with leaves on it. What is it supposed to have? It's supposed to have fruit. But it had no fruit at all. And so he cursed it. And um, we saw this was a picture of people who had the facade of being a Christian. People might look at them from afar and say, that's a Christian, right there. But if they were to pull back the leaves of their life, they see there's no fruit. You know, and Jesus said to such a person, either make the tree good and the fruit good, or make the tree bad and the fruit bad. Okay, so you have a choice to make when it comes to that. Now, of course, bearing fruit only is a result of doing what? Abiding in the abiding in the vine. Yeah, when you don't abide in the vine, you're a branch that does not produce fruit. You wither. You're like the branches I pruned off about a week ago. You're good for nothing but firewood. You don't remain on the tree. As Jesus says in John chapter 15. And then we have this issue of this whole council coming before Jesus and basically saying what to him? What would they basically say to him in, in Matthew 21, 23? <coughs> Ask him what, what authority does he uh, say this to by? Yeah. question is authority. The question is authority. And basically what they're saying, because they're, they're the religious authority in Israel, they're basically coming to him. The whole Sanhedrin, if you go to Mark's part, it gives you uh, the scribes as well. The chief priests, the scribes, come to him together, <coughs> and the elders, and they say, why are you doing this? They're basically saying, you have no authority to do what you're doing, according to us. And then there was this question of authority. And they, they exposed themselves by showing they're hypocrites because they would not say that John's baptism was from heaven because then they, why did they not believe it? They showed that they were cowards because they feared the multitudes and they showed they were liars by saying we don't know so they were cowards they were hypocrites and they were liars they revealed their true state and then jesus gives a parable about the hypocritical son the son said yeah i'll go and then he didn't go and the one who said i will not go the sinners the harlots the tax the ones who were entering the kingdom before them because they would not humble themselves and say you know what john's baptism was from heaven you know what What you're doing is from heaven. You know what? I'm going to repent. Instead of humbling themselves, they stay prideful. We know that pride goes before the fall. That's Proverbs 16, 18 says. So now we have another parable that Jesus gives them, starting in verse 33. Let's read. Here, another parable. There's a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. And last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. And when the vine dressers saw the son... They said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the vine dressers? They said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and leave his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruit in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and is, and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. 
Whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but whoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. When they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude, because they took him for a prophet. Uh, last time we talked about hypocrisy quite a bit, and we went to Isaiah 5, but Isaiah 5, I want to read it again, because it's just, it parallels this perfectly. And it's, it's probably the first thing these Jewish leaders would have thought of uh, when they heard Jesus speaking about this vineyard. So Isaiah chapter 5, <clears throat> starting in verse 1. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. He expected to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge be please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned and break down this wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug. There shall come up briars and thorns. I also command the clouds that there rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. So this is, these are the kind of words that were spoken to the Israelite nation before, right before judgment came upon them. And these words are spoken to them again, right before judgment comes upon them. Now let's, let's define who each of these people are in this passage here that we're talking about. The first person you see talked about is the landowner in verse 33. Now that would be God the Father. Okay? He's the landowner. Uh, in verse 33, the second person you see, and he leased it to vine dressers. The vine dressers are the religious leaders. Okay, Verse 34, we have his servants talked about there, and also in verse 35, those are the prophets who are sent to the house of Israel, who are sent to religious leaders. And then finally in verse 37, well not finally, that's not the last one. Verse 37, we see his son, that's obviously talking about Jesus. And then in verse 41, the other vine dressers, which are the new leaders that should come about, which would be the apostles, the Jews who trusted in the Messiah, who became leaders, and the Gentile leaders as well, who would trust in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so these are the people who we see talked about here. And so these, these vine dressers, these religious leaders, are leading the people astray to the point where no fruit is being brought forth in their life. And we've seen all throughout the Gospel according to Matthew, one of the problems they have is they're not teaching the Word of God. They're teaching the traditions of men. And so fruit is not brought forth in their life. Um, so leaders, to some degree, are responsible for the fruit that is brought forth into the people's life that they're leading. Now, of course, the people who they're leading have free will. There's no doubt about that. But the leaders are responsible for what they're teaching the people, for how they're leading the people, so they won't be led astray. Go to Ephesians 4 for a second, verse 11 and 12, and we'll see part of the purpose for religious leadership in the church. I have great concern for many people um, who I know who are becoming discontent with the American church system. And my, my, my concern for them, I'm not talking about anyone in this fellowship, of course, but my concern for them is they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And church leadership is biblical. It's biblical. I'd say that whether I'm in church leadership or not. So it's not about me, it's not about Brother Kevin, but this is what the Bible teaches. And you must understand, I talked to a brother last night who I think is a little confused in this issue because he's dealing with the prosperity gospel church and this whole system of you have to give your you have to sow the seed to get a seed back, all that nonsense. But you must understand, friends, 
that just because most of the American visible church has gone this far in this direction, has gone too far with these things, does not mean we throw it all out. A lot of it is based upon Scripture. And so Ephesians 4, uh, verse 11, it says, And he, this is Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. To we all come to the unity of the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So you see lots of good stuff in here. A whole body is needed. You can see that here. The whole body is needed, but he has appointed these leaders, listen to what it says again, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Till we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So that the leader's responsibility is to lead, to oversee, to teach proper doctrine and truth. The body's responsibility is to respond properly to biblical truth and to test what the man or is saying and to be a Berean about this. And if the leader is wrong in some way, it is their job to question in a respectful way, to uh, point back to the scriptures. And if the leader is a true leader, he will humble himself and change. Now these leaders we're seeing in Jerusalem were not true leaders. They were hypocrites, they were liars, they were not humble, they bound the people with heavy burdens that they themselves were not willing to care to carry. Uh, they made their converts twice the children of the devil that they were. They went over sea, land and sea to do so. Just because someone goes over land and sea to evangelize does not mean they're true leaders, does not mean they have proper doctrine, does not mean they're a child of God. And so the leaders have a responsibility, but it's also the body's responsibility to check the leader and to respond properly and allow the fruit to be produced in their life that God wants to produce as long as they're abiding in the vine. And so they had the fear of man. And you see at the end of this passage we just read today, if you really, listen to this friend, we heard a testimony from Brother Vaughn today, if you really think you have the truth, you need to stand up for it. Where, where are the men and women who will stand up for righteousness' sake and who will not fear man and what they can do to him, will not fear the multitudes because they think they're outnumbered? I tell you, you are outnumbered in a human perspective. Of course, I've said it many times, one man with God on the side is the majority no matter how many he's against. So we need to realize that. But these men obviously didn't have God on their side. So they were in the minority at that point in time. But a true leader of God will not be a hypocrite. He will not fear a man. And of course, he will not be a liar. He'll stand up for the truth, for Jesus, the truth, sake, at all times. These men, these leaders, the, same, the, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were not willing to do that. They were fake leaders. They were in it for themselves, and they cared about their own lives more than they cared about the lives of the people who they were leading. And so fruit was not produced. And it got to the point where they, when people were sent to them to correct them, how did they respond? They beat them. They killed them. They stoned them. Basically, they wanted to shut them up. And if someone comes, listen to this, friends. I know this is talking about the Jewish leaders, but let's make some application here. If someone comes to you with truth, your job is not to try to shut them up. Your job is not to get angry at them. Your job is to think about it Consider it, and if they're right, be humble. Submit. Admit your wrong, friends. We've all been wrong. They're probably all going to be wrong again. But the job that you have when someone corrects you, no matter how 
little or big of a brother or sister they are, is to submit to it. To submit to it. Not be like these wicked religious leaders who wanted to shut the people up. That's not the answer. Even if the, even if the unsaved sinner comes to correct you. Well, I know that might be humbling. Especially in open air if you're preaching the gospel. It may be humbling. But your job is to submit. To, to, to and realize that and be humble at all times. So the prophets came, and we see in Acts 7, uh, verse 51 and 52. Let's go there just for a second. I know we all know this passage, but this is Stephen speaking to the, the same people, the Sanhedrin. Probably uh, maybe a couple years later. Speaking to the whole group again. And uh, at the end of his, his uh, sermon here, his discourse, they had no problem the whole time. But in verse 51, he gets a little confrontational. He tells them the truth about themselves. He says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. And what was their response? Their response was not humbleness. Their response was not humility. See, God is being merciful towards these people. These same people that Jesus spoke to, did miracle signs of wonder. John the Baptist came to them. He spoke hard words to them. Stephen is filled the Holy Spirit, speaking hard words to them again as an act of mercy from God to rebuke them, to get them back to where they need to be as a religious leadership. Imagine if all of them were repent right here. Imagine if all of them would just repent. Just get right. How many people would they affect down the line? All the people that are following them and being deceived by them, if they would repent, how many people would that have affected down the line? Who would have repented as well? Because they're following these people. But their response was, they were cut to the heart, just like on the day of Pentecost. People were cut to the heart at the preaching of Peter. But they responded properly and got saved. They were cut to the heart, same response, same Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, same kind of hard words. And it says in verse 57, Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. They knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge him with his sin. When he had said this, he fell asleep. So you see the mercy of God. I mean, how, how merciful could God, how much more merciful could God be that He gives Israel? He, he's their, they're His choice vine. He puts them in this pleasant place, puts a tower in His midst, protection, blessing. He chose them out of all the people of the world. He chose them to be His choice nation. And he, he, he does all these miracle signs and wonders in the Old Testament. Sends His Son. There's all of these miracles in front of Him. They say it's of the devil in His midst. All, and then He sends John the Baptist even before that. And now the apostles, who are the replacement vine dressers, and Stephen, even more, how hard does your heart have to become? And what we need to realize, friends, is that God, His mercy at some point in time of reaching out to you or to someone, the same thing over and over again will end at some point in time. His mercy does not endure forever. When someone rejects, 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 rejects. We have to submit to it. We have to receive it. We must respond properly to it. Otherwise, we're going to be replaced too. We need to submit to it. And so instead of trying to quiet our correctors, we listen to them and we respond properly. Not gnashing teeth, not yelling at them, trying to drown them out, but responding properly. That's the mercy of God. Correction is the mercy of God. Your brother Kevin said about, I think about a month ago now, you know, we shouldn't despise correction. Correction is good. And according to Hebrews 12, 11, if you allow it to train you, it will produce a peaceable harvest of righteousness in your life. A peaceable harvest of righteousness. Correction is good. It shows that God is your father. And you are a legitimate son and daughter of God. And so we must receive correction. But you see that it, it was, this was taken not just from the vine dressers now. This is where it gets to the, the actual whole nation here. He says, it says in verse 41, And they said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably, 
That's talking about the vine dressers. And leave his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruit in their seasons. And then in verse 43, this is where it includes all the nation now that's not trusting in Christ, who is the Jewish people. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. So they have a responsibility for those Jewish people as well. They had responsibility to bear fruit. They had responsibility to check what the religious leaders were saying and reject it if it wasn't biblical. If it wasn't according to the Old Testament scriptures. Now in verse 41, just to deal with some of the harmonization issues here, it says, they said to him. Now the question is, who is they there? Let's, let's go to Luke for a second here. Luke chapter 20. As we look at Luke's, as we look at Luke's account of this situation, I, what I, one thing I want you to keep in mind is that the red letters, the, the red or black ink, is not inspired. Okay, the red or black ink was chosen by the people who made this. Okay, who printed this Bible up. Okay, now most times I would, I would assert from what I've seen, the red lettering is is accurate, but that doesn't mean it's always accurate. Okay, so to prove that, just look at Luke uh, twenty and verse sixteen. And what color is the beginning of verse 16 in your Bible? Yeah. It's in red. It says, He will come and destroy those vineyards and give them the, the vineyard to others. Now, in, in Matthew, it says, They said to him. And so, we have one of two things here. We either have, in verse 16, Jesus repeating what the they said, whoever those they are, or we have the uh, producers of the Bible with red letters there being inaccurate. Okay, Verse 16 doesn't say who said it. It puts it in quotations. You want to understand about the Greek Koine Greek, there's no quotation marks in the Koine Greek. Okay? There are periods, there are commas, there are question marks, but there are no quotation marks. Okay? So when it comes to figuring out who's doing what, we have to, the same way we do in English, he said. If you see he said, and then it says something, then we know it's in quotations. If you see a, a capitalization in the middle of a sentence, we know it's the beginning of a quotation. If we see a reference to the Old Testament, being quoted. We know it's in quotations. Okay, so it's the same thing with the, the Koine Greek. So I wanted to point that out to you, but w- look what it says right after that. It says in the, at the end of verse 16, and when they heard it, they said, certainly not. Well, I think we know who's saying that. It's a religious leader saying that. The question becomes, who's the they who said this in Matthew 21 and verse 41? Well, maybe they caught themselves. Maybe some of them said verse 41, and the rest of them said what Luke says. Some of them were catching on quicker before they let their mouth speak. But it's like kind of like what happened with David. Remember what happened with David? Same with Bathsheba. Nathan came, told him a parable. And what did David say? I don't, that man needs to be killed. And he answered before he realized it was talking about him. It was talking about him. And so this maybe the same situation happened here. That Some of them spoke before they realized it was talking about them. They say they don't want to give up their leadership. They don't want to give up their power. Uh, they rather they rather have the people stay in darkness than rather humble themselves, step down from leadership and say, I was wrong. I don't deserve to be a leader. I shouldn't be a leader. I'm stepping down. Let a real leader come in and do what he's supposed to do. They rather keep the people in darkness and say, certainly not. I want to stay a leader of this. Not all they're saying, certainly not to that, but certainly not to only the Jewish nation being God's people. That's, that's the problem a lot of the Jews had. They despise the Gentiles. They despise the other nations around them. But the only nation that will be Christ, that will be God's in the end, is a nation that produces the fruit of the gospel. Fruit meet for repentance. Now we see in verse 42, we see the stone with the, which the builders reject has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and was marvelous in their sight. Now, some people who believe in Gnosticism, Calvinism, would say that uh, the Lord's doing was that the builders rejected it. No, 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 no. The Lord's doing was that the, the stone has become the chief cornerstone. That is the Lord's doing. The precious one. Now, we'll get to First Peter here in a second. The precious one has become the chief cornerstone. Now, this, the fact that the builders rejected it is their fault. Their fault. That's not the Lord's doing. It's the Lord's doing that he became the chief cornerstone. Let's go to First Peter here for a minute. <coughs> Chapter 2. You see this other passage where it talks about this. The stone being the chief cornerstone. Starting in verse 4. 
coming to him, Jesus, as to a living stone, that's Jesus, who is rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness to his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now obtained mercy. So we have this Jew, Peter's writing to the Jewish people who are dispersed, he's looking in the first part of First Peter, dispersed throughout the nations, the pilgrims of Diaspora, uh, Jewish people who are dispersed all over the place, he's writing to them, and he says to them, you were once not a people, but are now the people of God, could not obtain mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So even being part of the elect people, doesn't mean they obtained mercy, it does not mean that, uh, that they were the people of God, because they, at one point in time, as a Jewish person, were not believing in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and therefore he was a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense to them. Now, the verse, the verse, and the verse eight says, uh, "They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed." Uh, they weren't appointed uh, to be disobedient. Those who are disobedient to the word are appointed to stumble. Okay, you have to understand that there. That those who are disobedient to the word, those people are the ones who are appointed to stumble. Because why? They're being disobedient to the word. It's really quite that simple. But Christ is the chief cornerstone, the elect one, the precious one. And we see in verse 9 that we are a chosen generation. The Greek word eklektos there, which we went through, I don't know, a couple months ago. It can also mean distinguished, choice, excellent. You're an excellent generation. You're distinguished from the rest of the generation. Why? Because you're not being disobedient to the word. You're being obedient to the word. You're trusting him. You're the one who has trusted, who's believed on him, who's the chief cornerstone, and you'll by no means be put to shame. And so those are the people who Matthew's referring to who are broken upon the rock. They've become broken. And what are the sacrifices of God? A broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Yes, the ones who become broken in spirit. These are the ones who the kingdom of God belong to in Matthew 5, which Jesus said. So the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The builders rejected him. And the builders even led the people in their rejections. Remember, at the beginning of the week, they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king of David, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest. At the end of the week, they're calling for his crucifixion. But we saw a couple weeks, a few weeks, a few teachings ago, that the reason is because the leaders were stirring them up. Reject them, reject them, crucify them, ask for Barabbas instead. And so even the leaders were leading the people in the rejection of the chief cornerstone. Thank God, not all of them rejected. Thank God, some of them later on received the chief cornerstone. They received it. Saul, Saul Tarsus is one of them. He was in rejection of the chief cornerstone at one point in time. But then he received him. Most of the early Christians uh, were, were Jewish people. And so... It, the nation is given to a, uh, the kingdom of God is given to a nation who is holy, they're royal, they're choice and excellent, they're those who have believed on him, who by no means put them to shame. That is the nation who will bear the fruits of Jesus Christ. Now go back to verse 38 just for a second here. They wanted to kill the heir. Why? Because they wanted to seize what? And what is his inheritance? The land. The land, the kingdom, the new Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that will come. That is the inheritance. And what were they in at that point in time? They were in the, they were in the land. But whose land is it, according to the Bible? This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. Now, if it's inheritance, it must belong to who? His father. The land doesn't belong to the Jewish people. It belongs to the father. And it belong, he's going to give it to who one day? The son. Who will then turn around and give it back to who? The father. And so, guess what? 
you individually are not the heir. But be, by being in Christ, by trusting in the chief cornerstone, you become co-heirs with him because he is the heir. Do they, you know, do they really think they can steal it from God? Do, you, do they really think they can take what belongs to God if they even had the power to do so? Yes, that's what they're thinking. Okay, so let's 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 bring this full circle here. Okay, we see once again in verse forty-six that they're being they're being fearful. They're not true leaders. They're being cowards. That they fear the multitudes. They're standing up to the multitudes. If they think they have the truth, they're fearful of the multitudes. We need to stand up to the multitudes, knowing that Christ is on our side, knowing that He will give us the strength we need to stand against unrighteousness and stand up for righteousness. And if we don't, we become part of those who are not bearing the fruits of the nation he's talking about, we become just like the other religious leaders. And according to Revelation 21 8, the cowardly will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we need to be righteous or as bold as lions. But let's bring this full circle. This is talking about the Jewish leaders, talking about God, the landowner, talking about the vine dressers with the Jewish the religious leaders, the servants, the prophets, the son which is Jesus Christ, the new vine dressers with the new leaders who will come. Okay? who Christ is grooming at this point in time, who will become leaders on the day of Pentecost and begin uh, the church of Jesus Christ. And um, so we're t talking about all these things. Let's, let's bring this full circle to us now. I mean, this is talking about the Jewish people here, but hasn't God blessed us? Hasn't God given us fruit? All these things, the blessings that the, that the Israelites have, we have even greater blessings. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We're born again of the Holy Spirit. Things that some of these wicked people never experienced. And so, and so if, if God is going to be this hard upon people who have less knowledge and less understanding and less accountability than we do, how much harder will he be on us, friends? So we need to examine ourselves. Are we part of this royal priesthood? Are we part of this holy nation? Are we part of this choice, excellent people who are bearing the fruits of Jesus? If not, we're in danger of being kicked out of this nation who are going to be co-heirs with Christ and have a part in his inheritance. We need to make sure we're bearing the fruits of repentance in our own life and having love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Listen to this definition of a vineyard. A spot selected for its fertility, separated from the surrounding fields, and cultivated with special care, with a view solely to fruit. Listen again. Let it, let it apply to the Jewish people we're talking about here, and let it apply to yourself. A vineyard, a spot selected for its fertility, separated from the surrounding fields, and cultivated with special care, with a view solely to fruit. With a view solely to fruit, to bear forth fruit. That's the view. That's the, that's the whole purpose of a vineyard. Is that it's they select a great spot. You don't select a spot with clay. You know, I was digging up my trees over there yesterday. Oh, clay! I said, God, Lord, change this ground, please. I don't know if these trees are going to make it. Uh, but you select a spot because you know it'll grow something. It'll bring forth. It'll be healthy for the thing you're planting there. It's separated from the surrounding fields. Different. It's separated from the surrounding fields. It's cultivated with special care. With a view solely to fruit. To bring forth fruit. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we, you know, many Christians know this scripture about how we're saved by grace through faith, but Ephesians 2, 10. To walk in the fruit that you were... Let me just read it before I chop it up. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8. I haven't quoted it in a while. i to sharpen this edge of my sword, I guess. For by grace you have been saved, you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If you are a Christian, you are saved by the grace of God, you are set apart, you are part of this holy nation, this choice people, this royal priesthood to bear fruit. To be a part of this nation that's bearing fruit. That's the nation Christ is coming back for. That is a nation who will be co-heirs with him. 
must not be like the Jewish people, these Jewish leaders, these people who rejected Jesus, who, who are going to be ground to powder someday. Back in Daniel 2, that rock which was cut, which was made with no man's hands, what did it come to do with the nations? They crushed them. Must not be a part of those nations. Part of the nation of Christ, the nation that's set apart, that's choice, that he gives, gives special care to. I mean, he's given us such special care. You know, I, I know we're, we're going to be in the kingdom of heaven, friends, if we persevere then, but think about the rest of the special care he's given us. How good he is to us. How mercy, I mean, I, I just, he's saying today, I thought about the mercy of God and how, how undeserving I am of it. No matter how holy I ever become, how undeserving I am of it. And it just humbles me. You know, his care for me. You know, every time he blesses me in some way, I'm, you know, why, why, why me? Why are you blessing me? So we need to make sure, friends, we're, we're, we're part of this nation. Okay, so I would just call, call you to examine yourself and those who are, of course, you have to understand, I'm, I'm not speaking to you guys, we're here speaking to people through video as well, to examine yourselves, to make sure you're, sure you're a part of this nation. Okay, and now we're going to open it up for uh, questions or... I just have something to add to be sure. brought up, uh, basically the responses from the... Uh, the different leaders. Yep. And obviously, a Paul is another very big example of a response. Yep. So very good. And then, you know, they have Paul here in Philippians 3, uh, verses 13, verse oh, 2, roughly. Oh, verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the, confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised of the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. For what things these were to me, I have counted lost for Christ. Or what things were gained to me, I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, in terms of Christ Jesus my Lord. For I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. That I might gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His suffering, and the form to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And he continues kind of talking about it, but I want to bring up the point basically, you know, Paul was one of these leaders. He gave up, he gave up his status. It's kind of like, I don't know how to explain it in, in art, that it may be somebody like Rick Warren in art, that yeah. maybe a big, big leader stepping down and saying, you know, I, I kind of thought about what about Brother Bond, because he kind of gave up. In a worldly manner, you have to do the dream. You could have been a huge football player with a lot of money and a worldly dream. But you give all that up because it's nothing. Yeah. You have all that, all that chance to go towards that for nothing. I don't think I'll see nothing like that. But I saw the fall, you know, humbling yourself and saying, I used to have all this stuff. I was a huge leader, respected in the church, and right. or in, my, in, my, in my power. I gave it all up. He was now, definitely there. Me. He was definitely there when Stephen was there. Yeah. And that, the Sanhedrin was there, and he was a part of it. Yeah. And he was there, you know, looking over the the uh, clothing, the coats of the people who were starting it. Yeah. So he was definitely there. He had something to give up. And he, he was uh, trained under Gamaliel, who was one of the, sort of like the top teacher of that day. He was really respected. And interesting you brought up Rick Warren. I've been watching the new uh, documentary from Pastor Joel Simmel on uh, the Emerging Church in the East. I didn't realize how bad he was. It's horrible. The things he's involved in and the things he's saying and doing, it's just wicked. He's demonic, man. Mm-hmm. I'm dad in my mind. I love also when he did, he sent me, that was pretty good too. He got online, I posted here in the last January, I think. He got posted in January, I think I saw. It was pretty good too. It's more on Rob Bell and Brian McLaren, though. I never saw him much other corners. Well, this one includes them too. Joe yeah. <coughs> Schimmel was in that too, I was going to say. So I just thought, I don't know, that doesn't even work, I don't think, but it's just the same. Like, we don't lift him up. There's certain people, you know, like, and he was in prison. These guys were lifting him up. Oh, he would have a lot to give up. Lots of power. Lots he power. would have a lot to give up. Yeah. He would. Something down from, kind of like the rich man, too, he was confronting. He had all this stuff. He yes. Yeah. Yeah, he'd be like Zacchaeus instead of like that, that rich man. Calvinism, the big chosen individual, he pointed in the beginning, 
talk about generations of choice or a generation or a group of people as choice is only actually obeying Christ from the heart and yeah. commands and are burden to us. So we want to uh, seek to do that. Yeah, eklektos, as we talked about about a month or so ago, uh, you look at Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's almost always used in that sense, choice, excellent, distinguished. And I look at my lexicon, and those are some of the main definitions for it. Choice, excellent, distinguished, different from the rest of the group. As you're comparing it from one group to the next, you look at the fatty calves, the Old Testament, all the different things you looked at. And so uh, it can mean chosen as and picked out, but it doesn't have to. And so that's the point I make with, with, with that in, in First Peter. Is that, and, that, and that seems to go along more with what he's saying there. I mean, he's using adjectives that are talking about how they're different, royal. Um, the chosen verb or the adjective? Uh, depends on how you say it, doesn't the context? Well, what I'm saying is he's using words that are modifying other words. Yeah, yeah. Chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, oh, okay. special people. And so th- that's what he's saying there. And so it seems like he's, I don't think he's saying picked out there. You know, I think he's saying excellent choice. Just to go more along with what else, what else he's saying there in the context. Yeah. <coughs> anybody else have anything else they want to add or any questions or objections or anything? Kind of like the religious versus the righteous, and I, th- I think the people who we experience the most uh, uh, opposition from is those who think they're God's children when they're not. And that's what happened to Jesus and the apostles, and so that's what we're going to deal with. Didn't didn't somebody have a story about this stone? Somebody reading Josephus? I think it was one of you three, or somebody in the 
I think probably oh, Captain mentioned yeah, it. Yeah, the story about this stone, like from the ship of How it came from nowhere and they don't know where it came from right, and yeah, it was well, perfect. And it was sent to them from across seas or something like that, right? Stone, which the door rejected. Um, how when they were building, they were actually, when they were building the, right. the, the, the temple right. there, that the, the cornerstone was set off inside the extended work and they were looking for, looking for the cornerstone. And uh, it was all off by itself, you know, just kind of left the shelf trashed trash over. So, I mean, if they knew that, that this would have been even more. Yeah. I, mean, that, I mean, the trick doesn't talk about that. It's extra yeah, biblical yeah, stuff. Exactly but right. if that's true, this would have impacted them even more to hear that. Yeah. They would have thought back to that. Well, yeah. If they brought up, they're the ones that brought up Herod's temple. Yeah, it took 40, 40 years. They knew a lot about the building of that temple. They sure did. They were really you're gonna just, You're going to build it in three days? Yeah. We are the living stones. We are the temple of God. 